my topics are critical issues for the beekeeper, particularly in the spring. This conference is about feed and nutrition. Um, whoop. Yeah. Firstly, is to follow on really from what God, John was talking about, the goal of our management through this coming out of winter and into the spring and early summer is really about building a hive up to a, where it's sort of bubbling up with bees. It's got probably coming up to around 60,000 bees in the hive. And, OK, that's a, to be accurate, that's a, a shot of a hive I've taken out of a book. It's being set up for queen rearing, but could well do if you put boxes on top of that, you get a honey crop. Probably too strong for pollination. You actually want a bit more room for bees, for queens to lay. But that would be a good goal if you're going for honey, to have a, a hive that's full of bees and is bubbling away. Obviously, food and nutrition play a critical part of it. As John was alluding, we need to start earlier in the season. In this area here, we, need to, we start feeding our bees in August, probably early August, sometimes even early in July if you're in Hawke's Bay. You need to prepare your hives for the pollination of cherries and the like, early season crops. That's why things like pussy willow there are so critical. They provide early season pollen and nectar for our bees. The other thing that's really important to get through on, a, on the nutrition side of things is the need for diversity of pollen sources. Bees, of course, don't have an immune system like we have. They rely to a great degree on hygiene within the, the hive. They're a very hygienic insect but they also get a lot of their immunity from what occurs in the natural environment and what they bring in. So diversity is really important for bees, for honeybees. And once again, if you're into a monoculture situation, you're compromising things. The other thing, of course, you've got to look at is, is the queen laying? Here's a shot of a really nice queen taken out of the... Um, Queen Bee Biology, Rearing and Breeding by David Woodward. Um, it's a book. I just acknowledged him. You need good queens, and probably with Varroa mite and the associated viruses and pathogens that we've had, have, it's steadily actually getting harder on our queens out there to survive at any great, for any great length of time. But with the pathogens and the and the changes in the hive environment, combined with degraded nutrition, we are getting to a stage now where the demand for queens and replacement queens is really going ahead. For example, last winter in Northland, there was, there's anecdotal evidence and some substantiated of some quite significant hive losses coming through the winter. A lot of them were failed queens, but they just didn't survive. Uh, parts of it was overstocking, part of it was varroa resistance. Um, but I've rung around quite a few of the principal queen breeders in New Zealand uh, just to try and get a handle on what's happening out there. And they're all experiencing a greater demand for mated queens, particularly through the year and in the spring and the autumn. So that is going to become quite a critical issue for beekeepers and, and the way you manage the queen and improve on that. Obviously, we need a healthy brood. We need a healthy hive. And that's, if you can see the photo, is an example of a, of, of a good frame of capped brood. That cohort's coming out very soon and it's going to populate the hive. It's going to, that hive is going to go ahead, it'll be available for pollination, it'll be available for honey production. We do have some diseases in New Zealand, with varroa being the major pest, of course, but one that's been endemic, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, was American fowl brood. Um, once again, sorry about the quality of the photographs there, they're taken from a book. Uh, but American fowl brood is a bacterial disease, that infects the larval stages of bees. And basically, it is very infectious. 
and it can result in the death of a hive if you leave it and don't do anything about it. In New Zealand, we have a... Um, the, the control we use is destruction and burning of infected clinical signs of American fowl brood, and it's a notifiable disease uh, that we report to a management agency. Uh, with every case, we have statistics on it, and through the pest management strategy that's been developed now since about 1998, I think, um, we have managed to bring down the, uh, the incidence of American fowl brood in New Zealand, as I said, to something like 0.01% of hives. We do have some hot spots at times that occur, but that pest management strategy is working very well indeed. Varroa, the major pest we have, the major challenge. And from that will stem the problems we will have increasing with viruses and other pathogens, because we've got, in the photograph actually, photograph actually does show a bee there with three varroa, three varroa attached underneath the plates along its abdomen. abdomen. Um, it's like a malaria mosquito, so to speak, if you could imagine, biting you um, and injecting the viruses in, into you. Uh, it has a great debilitating effect on bees. It can kill out a hive. It's really the viruses and other pathogens that do the final damage. But Varroa is a major pest and will continue to be a major pest. It'll be a major challenge. It's something that this country really needs to get to grip with because our principal scientist said to me the other day, well, he's mentioned it a couple of times, he said that Varroa is a, was a problem when it came in, but Varroa resistance will be an even greater problem than Varroa. And we're starting to go down the track that all other countries with Varroa have had, or have got, whereby you get 10 year or 12 year block, Varroa first appears here, you start to get resistance to the synthetic chemicals that are used to control it. They're in the region of 90% effective. We do have a range of organic treatments which go to about, at the best, 70% effective. So you might kill 70% of your Varroa, but you'll still have a 30% population there that will bounce back. Ways of mitigating, as I mentioned, breeding programs are ongoing. Um, we have a thing called Better Bees in Dunedin, which is working with the University of Otago on um, breeding programs. We have Nelson Honey in um, Nelson. They're working with scientists from Cawthron Institute in breeding. There is another queen breeder in Northland who is working with the trees, the um, Better Bees program. They, are, they need funding, okay? Sustainable farming funding has funded uh, Better Bees, and I think Agmart has funded part of the Nelson program as well. But compared with a, nine, a $5 billion industry, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions. Okay, it would be nice to have more money, but a lot more could be done because, as I say, the, uh, the honeybee is so critical to our economy. Varroa control, there's just two examples there. The thymol pad there, if you could see it, it's, it's an organic treatment. And there's one there, it's a plastic strip, it's called Apistan. There isn't, it, the, the mites are becoming resistant to that. When we get high levels of varroa, we get um, viruses that are starting to um, appear and affect bees. Viruses have already, already always been present. And uh, this is just an example of a thing called deformed wing virus. If you're an insect, obviously you need wings to get around. Well, this is probably a pretty bad thing to be involved with. I'd just like to mention, you know, we have a great diversity of people here today. We've got John McLeod over here, who's done some work on, he's a scientist doing some work on deformed wing virus. So the critical issues of building a hive up for the spring is to make them available for pollination, 
to an extent that they don't swarm, that's why we split them. You need probably 40, 50,000 bees for a good pollination unit, and enough room for the queen to be actively laying. But if you want a hive that's going to get a decent honey crop, it has to be like that first photo, where it's bubbling over with bees. This is a photograph here of some of my hives that's up the coast there on a Manuka crop. Um, we, we were supering up hives. That's the final goal, to get hives up there in a strong condition, be able to put some boxes on so you can get a high value crop. The only other thing I was going to add a bit about was the economics of beekeeping, and it's probably outside of the critical issues, but um, in my first talk I really didn't mention too much about market access. We have had some issues around getting honey into some of our export markets, and if we lost those markets that would have impact directly on beekeepers' income. And with overseas uh, laboratories and governments that have been testing our honey, um, and in various ways, and we've had some issues about market access being blocked. And one of the principal people in this room who has done a great deal of work in ensuring that we get continued market access is um, Karen Rogers with her work through GNS Science. I won't go into the great de detail of it, but through the, the work that she's done and the work with international other governments overseas, that's helped the economics of beekeeping that has added on to the, some of the critical issues around pollination and beekeepers. And Karen will be talking a little later about some of her work. Anyway, that's me for the moment.